The 1988 Disney film Who Framed Roger Rabbit weaves a tale quite familiar to a fan of classic film noir. A down-on-his-luck private detective, Eddie Valiant, accepts what appears to be a simple job from the head of an animation studio, R.K. Maroon, only to wind up in a web of, as he puts it towards the end of the film, greed, sex, and murder. Indeed, Eddie's discovering not a single guilty individual, but a corrupt society in which wealthy and respectable people are linked with gangsters and crooked politicians, is an integral part of the hard-boiled detective myth, a key staple of many films noir. Yet Who Framed Roger Rabbit differs quite significantly from classic films noir and so-called neo-noir films in one key technical way, its use of animation. The bright, cheery, and zany antics of tunes both within and without Toontown seems at odds with the serious, brooding nature of a film noir. Because of this, Who Framed Roger Rabbit can come off as a parody of film noir, rather than the sort of continuation of the tradition like with Chinatown or The Long Goodbye. However, Who Framed Roger Rabbit uses pastiche and a few elements of light parody with a postmodern sensibility, using the techniques of generic parody for an ultimately serious purpose. Moreover, mixed in with the pastiche of film noir is a surprising criticism of racism not seen so explicitly in classic films noir or even more contemporary neo-noirs, making clear that this film is not just a parody or replica of a beloved genre for a new audience, but a film concerned with social critique as well as entertainment. While Who Framed Roger Rabbit has a more comedic slant than the typical classic film noir, it takes seriously many of the stylistic and narrative elements of it. The opening credits feature period-typical jazz music, and later on-screen text tells the viewers that the film takes place in 1947 as if the fashion and technology didn't already allude to its temporal setting, in the midst of the classic film noir movement. Our main character, Eddie Valiant, is introduced in the shadows of a maroon cartoons film studio, in mise-en-scene that evokes a chiaroscuro lighting present throughout classic films noir. The dialogue spoken by many characters in the story, particularly Eddie and his associates, seems to come right out of a Raymond Chandler novel or one of its many film noir adaptations. Even elements like the mise-en-scene of Eddie's apartment, which pokes fun at the classic film noir private detective office by combining it with Eddie's messy living space, still take seriously what they take from classic film noir, as this hybrid office apartment is where several key revelations take place. In terms of the film's setting, Los Angeles of Who Framed Roger Rabbit contains the societal moral decay present in the classic film noir, best exhibited when Eddie stows away on a red car with some kids that give him a pack of cigarettes. Narratively, the film contains many stock characters of film noir, such as Jessica Rabbit as a femme fatale, Lieutenant Santino as a friend on the force to our PI main character, and, of course, Eddie Valiant as an archetypal hard-boiled detective. Like Philip Marlowe in Murder, My Sweet and other PIs in films noir, Eddie does not proactively search for clues like an Agatha Christie detective, but he instead investigates through movement and encounter. He collides with the web of conspiracy until he has exposed its outlines. Moreover, the emphasis on Eddie's tragic past with Toontown and metamorphosis into a Toon-hating curmudgeon recalls the dual nature of Jeff Markham or Jeff Bailey in Out of the Past, as well as fellow neo-noir detective J.J. Giddy's complex relationship with the titular neighborhood of Chinatown. In fact, who Framed Roger Rabbit owes a lot of its plot to Chinatown. While classic films noir did feature corruption, such as Mike Lagana's criminal syndicate in The Big Heat, and one of the central themes of the hard-boiled myth is the ambiguity between institutionalized law enforcement and true justice, classic films noir were largely prevented from illustrating widespread corruption in the justice system due to the censorship of the Hays Code. Chinatown, and thus Who Framed Roger Rabbit, faced no such restrictions depicting the corruption of the system and the greed of industrialists without euphemism. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it is outright stated that Judge Doom bought the election to work as a judge in Toontown. Moreover, towards the end of the film, Judge Doom reveals that he owns Cloverleaf, a company that has bought out the Pacific Electric Railway Company, an obvious conflict of interest that proves to be the ultimate motive for the murder of Marvin Acme and the framing of Roger Rabbit. Even Acme, who is presented as a kind, if lecherous, man who loves tunes in Toontown, is essentially a slumlord, literally owning Toontown and putting the tunes in jeopardy with his sudden death. Despite the film's similarities to its neo-noir contemporary Chinatown, however, the film's somewhat unsatisfying happy ending brings it back to its film noir roots. Judge Doom is killed, and his plan to bulldoze Toontown to build a freeway is thwarted, and tunes have Toontown given back to them. This ending denies the real-life cannibalization of the Pacific Electric Railway Company to make way for freeways, an ending typical of films repurposing traditional genres. A traditional genre in this myth are probed and shown to be unreal, but then the myth itself is at least partially affirmed as a reflection of authentic human aspirations and needs. While Who Framed Roger Rabbit takes advantage of the perks of being produced in the late 80s, such as a relative lack of censorship, it ultimately rehashes the classic film noir more than it takes it in a different direction. While the film's use of wacky animation may seem antithetical to the conventions of film noir, 
Who Framed Roger Rabbit blends the medium of animation with live-action film stylistically, narratively, and thematically. The jazzy opening credits that set the tone for this film as a neo-noir are immediately subverted by the Golden Age cartoon-style opening credits of a film within the film starring Baby Herman and Roger Rabbit. Almost everything Toonie seems at odds with the live-action noir setting. The live-action studio of maroon cartoons contrasts greatly with the cartoon set. The slapstick violence tunes enact on one another, just for fun, has decidedly unfunny consequences for humans such as Teddy Valiant and Acme. And the sunny singing introduction to Toontown is the opposite of the dark tunnel Eddie has just driven through to try and find Jessica. Even the adultery Eddie is tasked with photographing, a nod to Giddy's first job in Chinatown, is subverted in a toony way with Acme and Jiska literally just playing patty cake with one another, though such action has the same effect on Roger as if she were actually having sex with Acme. However, the lines between the noir live-action world and the seemingly anti-noir toon world are not so clear-cut. Within Toontown itself, there is a seedy underbelly. Eddie finds himself in a dark alleyway not unlike the place where Davy's manager gets shot by two goons and killer's kiss. He too almost meets his end here were not for Jessica alerting him to Judge Doom's presence. Moreover, in the human world, Humans congregate at the underground Ink and Paint Club, a clear analog to the racially segregated Cotton Club in New York, which stars tunes and a number of more risque acts in the typical slapstick-written studio affair. And finally, the existence of tunes as archetypal noir characters like Jessica, the Toon Patrol, and Judge Doom muddles the idea of tunes and Toontown existing fully separate from the live-action world of film noir, a notion further complicated by Jessica's quip, I'm not bad, I've just drawn that way. The borrowing and subversion of all these stylistic, narrative, and thematic elements create a postmodern pastiche of the film noir, made new not by parroting or satirizing the dead genre, but by altering the context and presentation of its production, forcing viewers to look at both film noir and animation in a new light. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a complicated example of the postmodern pastiche. According to Robert Stamm in The Politics of Postmodernism, the most typical aesthetic expression of postmodernism is not parody, but pastiche, a blank, neutral practice of mimicry, without any satiric agenda or sense of alternatives, nor for that matter any mystique of originality beyond the ironic orchestration of dead styles. While Who Framed Roger Rabbit may seem parodic due to its use of comedy, Parody capitalizes on the uniqueness of these styles and seasons on their idiosyncrasies and eccentricities to produce an imitation which mocks the original, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit does not mock film noir. The film harkens back to classical film noir not with parody or quoting such texts as Joyce might have done, or a Mahler, but by incorporating film noir into the basics of its narrative and production, i.e. pastiche. Who Framed Roger Rabbit does in different ways what Polanski does in Chinatown, Set the elements of a conventional popular genre, for example, the hard-boiled detective, the femme fatale, in an altered context, thereby making us perceive these traditional forms and images in a new way. The altered context here being a historical color film featuring animated characters and backgrounds. However, though Who Framed Roger Rabbit mostly adheres to being a pastiche of the classic film noir, it does bring a deviant theme to the table, racism a topic essentially barred from all classic cinema under the Hays Code. While all of the human and humanoid characters in the film are white, save for one black member of the armed forces in Dolores' bar, the tunes serve as a fairly explicit allegory for black people and other ethnic and racial minorities in entertainment and society more broadly. The Ink and Paint Club, for example, in its evocation of whites-only clubs such as the Cotton Club, places tunes in the role of black performers and laborers who were not allowed to patronize the establishments that they performed or worked at. When Dumbo scares Eddie while in R.K. Maroon studio, Maroon laughs and comments, the best part about working with tunes is that they work for peanuts, alluding to the massive wage inequality between black and white performers and economic exploitation of racial minorities in general. And while Toontown is mostly depicted as a happy, if chaotic, place, discussions surrounding it and depictions from the outside of it, like when Eddie meets with Lieutenant Santino and sees Yosemite Sam fly over the wall between Toontown and Hollywood, make it clear that Toontown is essentially a ghetto. And finally, though characters in the film, including Roger, seem sympathetic towards Eddie's prejudice, the discriminatory bias Eddie has towards tunes throughout the film can't be described as anything but racism or xenophobia. Though the film only broaches the subject of race allegorically, much like the later Warner Brothers animated film Cats Don't Dance, its inclusion as a subject at all in an otherwise relatively accurate or faithful recreation of film noir illustrates the shifting values of both film producers and audiences, as not only the traditional genres but the cultural myths they once embodied are no longer fully adequate to the imaginative needs of our time. In this way, Who Framed Roger Rabbit stands out from contemporary neo-noir films not only technically, but narratively and thematically. Through its mimicking of classic films noir, both generally and specifically, 
Who Framed Roger Rabbit at its core is a pastiche of film noir. However, the film also owes a great deal of debt to other neo-noir films such as Chinatown and slapstick cartoons from the golden age of American animation. While the film has obvious resonance with both the classic film noir and its contemporary neo-noirs, its noir status is often relegated to the background by its cartoon influence. Any pretense of mystery as to the identity of the killer is thrown out the window immediately upon the entrance of the cartoonishly evil, and aptly named, Judge Doom. And though the plot of the film focuses on trying to uncover the reason behind the murder of Marvin Acme, the most interesting thing about the film is not its plot, but its depiction of tunes in Toontown. The addition of not only a new genre into the mix, as is the case with films like Brick, which combines neo-noir with a high school drama, but a new medium as well, frees who framed Roger Rabbit from relying solely on its neo-noir aspects to tell a story, allowing for topics and themes not broached in other neo-noirs to flourish in the film. 